This big up your hymn book, if you would please, that will be 151. 151. And that'll be a responsive reading this morning. And when you find that page, I encourage you to stand. For those of you that are willing and able, uh, 151. Partakers of Christ. And we'll read responsibly this morning. 151. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Father in heaven, we rejoice today in being able to be in your house. We thank you for health and strength that allows us to come. And we come with words of praise. We are blessed as the choir brought us into this atmosphere of blessedness and worship. And Father, we pray that everything that takes place forward will be honor and glory to your name, for you are worthy of all of our praise. And it is in the name of Jesus that we do pray these things. Amen. Amen. Remain standing and turn to 117, if you would. 117. Praise Him. Praise Him.
Aren't you glad that he first loved you? <laughs> I was thinking as we were singing, I can't remember how young, but it was very young. I learned the words, Jesus loves me, this I know. The Bible tells me so. I don't know about you this morning, but that blesses my heart. And I'm glad I love him, and I'm glad he loves me. What a privilege to be together this morning as we have worshiped in music and song and been ministered unto. Uh, the choir got us started right, didn't they? Oh, I tell you, that was great. We appreciate our choir. Well, we are delighted to have Gladys Self. Uh, we had to kind of twist her arm, but not too hard. You didn't suffer any injury, did you? As I twisted. <laughs> But we, we, wanted, we needed someone who would be a missionary president for our, for our church. And whether you know this or not, Gladys used to be the district missionary, uh, missionary president. And she served wonderfully well. And she is a creative sort of person. So she's going to share with you in a few moments uh, what the Lord has given her. She didn't ask me if it was all right. I just told her, go ahead and do it. I have that much confidence in her. Gladys, step right up here. Don't be bashful. <laughs> okay. You got, you're bringing your bag man with you. <laughs> He's down there. Well, you need to step up to that microphone, okay? <laughs> Some more. Keep going, you're wasting time. <laughs> I have a bigger one. <laughs> it's on the organist. Okay. <laughs> The message today is to get on the ball for missions. How many of you know what alabaster, why it is called alabaster, how long it's been that we have had an alabaster offering, or know anything about it whatsoever except that we do an alabaster offering? If you know anything about it, would you raise your hand? Oh, I am pleased to see some hands. Do you know it started in the 1940s? The Church of the Nazarene was having a uh, time of financial crunch, and they needed to develop a way to spur on the offerings for missions. Uh, Elizabeth Venon, a pastor's wife, the daughter of a pastor, they lived in Florida. She was a member of the NMI Council, General Council. She was in Kansas City at a General Council meeting. 
and she was asked to come up with a plan to raise funds for the fields. On her, she took the train home, and on her way home, she was having her devotions, and she read, a woman came to him, meaning Jesus, with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. You know, the disciples found fault with her for doing that. Why do you use this expensive perfume that way? Why don't you sell it and get the money? And you know what Jesus replied? He said, she has done a beautiful thing for me. From that time, that was in 1949, and from that time until today, we have, we have had an alabaster box. You know what it looks like. It's going to be right down here next Sunday, and I want you to be prepared to be on the ball for missions. Uh, her, her motto that year was, give up a want for a need. Give up a want for a need. What has Alabaster done for the Church of the Nazarene? It has generated more than $100 million. I can't even think in those terms, can you? $100 million for land purchase and construction of 56 hundred sites throughout the world. That has included 9,000 projects. It has only happened as we get on the ball for missions. And I pray that this week, this year, that we will be on the ball for missions and that we will give up a want for a need. Okay, God bless you. But I didn't know what she was going to do, and I didn't. <laughs> but what a great object lesson. So next Sunday, there will be right down here, you've seen it many times through the years, our little alabaster church that uh, we use, and uh, you be prepared, and I know that God will bless as you, oops, look out, he's still got some left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now he's gone. Now they're gone. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gladys. We appreciate it. Now you can understand why she was so successful as a missionary, as the district missionary president. She has creativity that, uh, well, I was going to say can be scary, but anyway. <laughs> but it's always good. Thank you again. Brother Gary. Oh, oh, oh. 
Thank you, Brother Gary. It is a thought to contemplate, isn't it? It is what we look forward to. That day when there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin, no more of anything that has saddened our lives in this world. That is Beulah Land. Thank you. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open them with me to Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 1 to 10. I'd invite you to stand as we look to this letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. As we told you last week, it was what we called a cylindrical letter or a letter that was circled or circulated amongst all of the churches in Galatia. And we're just going to Refresh our memories a little bit uh, in verses 1 to 5 and then 6 to 10 is where we'll be preaching from this morning. And as we have told you last week, if you want to follow along, you just be reading and studying the book of Galatians that I believe the Lord will bless. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory 
forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you by who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another but there is uh, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. For, I do, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men, for if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ, shall we pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful today for your blessing, for the privilege of being in this place and being ministered unto through the power of your spirit through music and song and the word. And now, Lord, we would ask that you would speak anew and afresh to each of our waiting hearts. We thank you for your word this morning, for the opportunity that we have to turn our hearts and minds uh, to that which you inspired long ago that has stood the test of time to speak even to this day and the evil day in which we live. And now, Father, I pray that you would anoint these who would hear this one who would speak that the word of God might dwell richly in each of us, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul is obviously greatly concerned. A matter of fact, this was not just a usual greeting that he gave. Uh, some would say it was kind of a normal apostolic greeting, but it really wasn't. He was saying, listen, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, not of men nor through man, but through the very confrontation, remember, on the Damascus Road? We talked about that last week. He encountered Jesus Christ like Matthew before him who was called from the receipt of custom. Jesus, in a divine visitation, remember he said, Saul, Remember, Paul's name was Saul before Paul, and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And you remember how that Saul was so overcome and fell from the animal of which he was riding and had a glorious conversion. Not anybody was just ready to take Paul in because he had persecuted the church feverishly and caused many... Great harm held the coats of those who stoned Stephen, remember? And so consequently, after three days, a brother who took him in, remember, received his sight. And from that day on, he became an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was not uh, one who was a part of the original group. However, the scripture tells us, and we know that he did venture to Jerusalem, and he was... Uh, ordained hands laid on him by Peter and those gathered there and then went out into ministry, but he began to preach the gospel without fear or favor, recognizing that he had a specific calling, a calling to preach to the Gentiles. By the way, that's us, in case you didn't know that. That's us. And he set out upon this journey to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to preach the gospel and traveled through Galatia. And Galatia, as we told you last week, is a, is a country that's kind of in the middle of a peninsula surrounded by other countries between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And it was, uh, it was inhabited by people who had migrated from the British Isles, uh, from uh, Scotland, Ireland, uh, uh, Britain itself, or the, the island, uh, the, the British uh, island, I should say, England, we would call it. 
and uh, they were a Celtic people, remember? And, and uh, we found out that Celtic people, according to the scholars, are fickle. I asked the question, do you know anybody that's fickle? Some of you kind of smiled. I think you might know somebody that's fickled. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they like something today, and then next week they're not so sure they like it. And so consequently, Paul was greatly concerned because he had preached the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly to them. And so this is really a, a pretty, uh, you know, it's kind of like the pastor taking the congregation to the woodshed. You know what I'm saying? Now, most people today wouldn't have any idea what a woodshed is. But those of us who live long enough understand the... Uh, Vernacular. My, my folks didn't have a woodshed, but they had a razor strap. I'd rather think I'd had the woodshed. Uh, they believed in applying the board of correction to the seed of knowledge. Okay. And um, they, uh, they took seriously the matter of correction. Paul is deeply concerned, he raises the question, what in the world has happened to you that you have believed another gospel? You see, there were those who came in and followed Paul in his preaching and they began to try to attempt to have those who had believed in the grace of Jesus Christ, the confession of sin, the repentance of sin, being born again, salvation by grace through faith. Say, do you know that's still the, the cardinal doctrine of the church anywhere and everywhere? If it gets very far from that, it's not the gospel. And consequently, Paul was greatly concerned. There were those who came along and said, oh yes, Paul's gospel is is, is all right, it's good, but, and then they tried to bring back uh, those rituals and customs that were a part of the Jewish people's tradition. And uh, they tried to impose upon those Gentiles those things that would make them Jewish. Paul got very disturbed about it, and rightly so. And you know, isn't it interesting, even in our day, there are people who will come along with something that seems to be rather unique and rather, how shall we say, uh, uh, just kind of appealing, and, and they will get people's eyes off the main thing and, and get them thinking in terms of things that really aren't essential whatsoever, and yet it'll be presented as essential. You ever have anybody come along and say, well, if you truly are a Christian, this is what it is. I've known Christians who wanted to wear prayer shawls. You don't need a prayer shawl. That comes out of the Old Testament. That comes out of the Jewish tradition. Paul said they, they were Judaizers. What he meant was they're trying to take you back in to the Old Testament rite and ritual. And what's the lesson there? Let me tell you today, your, your salvation is not dependent upon rite or ritual. Your salvation today is dependent upon that simple truth I gave you a moment ago. Your sins are confessed and you have repented and by the grace of God through faith you are saved. And anybody who preaches anything other than that preaches something that is contrary to the scripture. You see the fact of the matter is it's all about sin and the necessity of sin to be dealt with according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that gospel that Paul said to the Romans I quoted to you last week, he was not ashamed of because it was the power of God unto salvation. Oh, but they wanted these Celtic people to submit to all of the rites and rituals of the Jewish religion and the Jewish tradition. I want to tell you now, we believe in ritual, but we do not believe that ritual will save you. We believe in the ritual of baptism. 
But baptism will not save you. As one fellow said, if you're not born again before you're baptized, you just go in a dry center and come out a wet one. You understand? You're not saved by receiving communion at the Lord's table. Because communion is not something that can save you. Only the blood of Jesus Christ, only the forgiveness of sin. Now, is it important to be baptized? Is it important to receive communion? Absolutely it is. Couldn't be more important. I always encourage people to receive the uh, sacrament of, of the bread and the cup, and I encourage believers to be baptized, and, and those things are important. And any other ritual, their, their ritual is all right, but it's not a means of salvation, you understand. You're not going to be saved by lighting a candle. You're not going to be saved by being dipped in the baptistry tub. You're not going to be saved by receiving the bread and the cup. You're only going to be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ and by the grace of God that enables you through faith to lay hold of this salvation that is absolutely the core and essential of all that we are about. Paul was deeply troubled. He said, how quickly you've gotten caught up in all this other stuff. Can I tell you, after 50 years of pastoring, I've seen more than a few people get caught up in other things and get taken off track and off course and gone down a course that led them to defeat and to despair and to the point where they don't even want to have anything to do with the church. I told you it was old several, actually it was back early summer about the man who came and, and uh, came into the church and he was making a delivery and his truck had overheated and he sat down and he started engaging me in conversation and he was so confused and the guy had once been a minister of the gospel and he didn't know, he didn't know what the name of God is. Well, I can tell you, if you go back there, you'll find out. Remember what was given instruction there in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis? Tell him that I am hath sent thee. He is the great I am. You can look at his name in many uh, various delineations, whether it be Jehovah, Jireh, Yahweh, however you want to describe it, but it says his name is I Am. As I tried to help that dear brother, I could tell the longer I talked, he was so confused. He had been caught up in something that was so, so in, in how, how shall I say, so in charge of his thoughts, he couldn't come to the reality of the simple truth that the gospel of Jesus Christ is that alone which is able to save. It has nothing to do with, with how you call upon God in his name or any of the rest of it. It's just simple faith believing. It's trusting in that which was done on the cross. Paul said, what in the world has happened to you people? You know, sometimes I've had that feeling myself, Brother Gary. What in the world has happened to people that they don't seem to understand the importance of the things uh, uh, that pertain to the gospel of Jesus Christ and how easily distracted they are by something that seems to be new and unique and something unusual? You know, I've seen more than a few people get caught up in this well, we used to call it uh, meditation of the mind. What's that song you sing, old Buddha, in meditation of the mind? Brother Gary sings a song. It's, it's not, uh, well, it's just kind of an old country song, but it's a good song. And it says uh, something about Buddha and Muhammad and meditation of the mind. Now, am I not suggesting, am I suggesting you not meditate on the scriptures? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these people. You know, the big deal today is yoga. Have you figured that out? There are places that have rooms, places of employment that have rooms for people to go do their yoga because that's going to make them better. That's going to help them to clear their mind and their heart. Well, I want to tell you something. If you want your mind and heart cleared this morning, I have a remedy and it's a lasting remedy, and it'll take you all the way from earth to glory. It'll take you to Beulah land, and that is simply this. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart and believe in him unto salvation. Paul says, what in the world has happened to you people? You know, it is sad, isn't it, when you look around and see the number of people who are so confused. 
people who just don't seem to understand. They have been distracted by varied and many means of, of preaching of a gospel that's not really the gospel. It's somebody's idea. It's somebody's quirk. Let me assure you this morning, Paul took it seriously. How seriously did he take it? He said, if I come to you, and I'm thinking he's thinking later in life. If I come to you after having preached the gospel to you and preach another gospel, I'm accursed. And he said, even if an angel preaches another gospel, did you know the devil has angels? He does. And the scripture admonishes us to try the spirit to know what spirit we're of, doesn't it? And he said, even if an angel comes to you and presents another gospel than the gospel I've preached to you, let him be accursed. That's a pretty serious admonition. That they would be destroyed for preaching any other gospel. Paul says, if they preach another gospel, they're cursed. I, I know this may seem hard to believe, but the truth is, anybody who believes any other gospel is cursed. Oh, you say, preacher, that's so intolerant. I'm glad you brought up tolerance. You didn't know you did, did you? But you did. G.K. Chesterton, a Roman Catholic theologian, by the way, there are Roman Catholics who had some great insight. G.K. Chesterton, the Roman Catholic theologian, said this, tolerance is a virtue to a man who has no convictions. You say, well, preacher, that's intolerant what you're preaching. I mean, don't you know there are many ways to heaven? No, I don't know there are many ways to heaven. I know there's only one way to heaven. And that way is the way that Jesus spoke of when he spoke to his disciples in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And beloved, this morning, there is no other way and there is no other gospel. You know, sometimes we Christians get accused of being, you know, hard and we just won't understand anything other than, you know, we, we're so legalistic. I'm not a legalist. I just happen to believe the word of God is the word of God. I happen to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I happen to believe that there's no other way than the way Jesus said there was that way through him. Paul was distressed about this condition and he was trying to get their attention. You see, we live in a day when we are being asked to be willing to tolerate and to be compromising and to make room for other schools of thought. Well, I wanna tell you something, that's not what the word teaches. That's not what Paul preached. He said, if we try to go a different way, we are cursed. I am cursed. An angel is cursed. If we believe another gospel, we are cursed. If you think there's any other way than the way of Christ, you're headed down the broad road that leads to destruction. Beloved, this morning, I know people say, well, you know, doctrine. Oh, that's almost a dirty word, doctrine. Well, the scripture just happens to say that all scripture is given for correction and doctrine. So I want you to understand Paul understood. <laughs> and we need to understand today as well. Let us go from this place today more convinced than ever that Jesus saves and he is the only means whereby there is salvation and there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. And the scripture says there's no other name given whereby men must be saved but the name of Jesus. And any other gospel is a false gospel. 
any other gospel leads people down the path to destruction. Aren't you glad for the gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that is able, according to the scriptures, to save to the uttermost. Oh, this morning I trust you're saved. And if you're not saved, there's no other gospel. There's no other means whereby you might be saved. There aren't many roads to heaven, there's only one. It's called the highway of holiness, Isaiah. Remember over there in Isaiah 35, 8 said, there's a highway there and a way, and it is called the highway of holiness. And that holiness is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Shall we stand? Father in heaven, what a privilege to be in this place today. Our hearts have been blessed and ministered unto through music, song, the word. And today we are glad for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're glad today that it is indeed the only means of salvation. And there is power in the blood. And we're glad today that we can say, save, save by his power divine. Save to new life sublime. We thank you, Lord. And we give you praise and give you glory. And ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Brother Gary, what's the number? He's my deliverer and him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. No, please stand with me. Praise the name of Jesus. You're free to go. Come back tonight, sisters. Praise the name.